morning once again. This morning's scripture reading is going to be Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16. Again, if you're turning along, that's Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. And he himself gave some to the apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children, tossed to and fro, carried, carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but, speaking the truth in love, may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. You may be seated. Good morning once again. It is great to be with you this morning. I look forward to sharing this portion of God's word with you. Uh, last week I had the privilege of getting to sit in the upstairs church uh, while we had a guest speaker. That was my first uh, time visiting the upstairs church. And uh, you, know, you guys made me feel welcome, so thank you. Uh, but it's very different from one to the other. It's interesting. Uh, you would think we're in the same room, but I mean, there's a different perspective. You see things differently, but you know, we're still worshiping together. And I look forward to the time when God grants us the, uh, the opportunity to be in our new building where we're all sitting together. It's going to be great. It's going to be fantastic. But it was nice to be able to sit with my wife last week, which is a very rare thing for me to be able to do uh, during worship services. We're going to continue our series this morning on And Walk in Love. You know, Ephesians chapter 4 and chapter 5 our practical instruction for daily living how to live a godly life in this present age it's amazing and as we've gone through this study we've seen time and again the practical instruction that's there and in Ephesians chapter 5 verses 1 and 2 we're told right in the middle of all this therefore be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ has also loved us and given himself a sacrifice for us as a sweet-smelling aroma. It is a beautiful thing for us to be able to think about imitating God and walking in love, just like Christ. But the challenge is before us, because we often find ourselves falling woefully short of that ideal. And so these instructions that we have here that were given to the church in Ephesus over 1900 years ago are just as practical today for us as they were for them then because human nature hasn't changed we haven't changed and we continue to struggle with many of the same things so we want to look at those things and make correction walk here walk in love refers to our manner of living How, what is the what is normal what is typical of you in your walk if it's typical of you to uh, live in a certain way, then that is your walk. And our what is to typify our walk as Christians is love like God had for us, like Christ had for us. That, that, is, that is to be our manner of living. That doesn't mean that we don't struggle. That doesn't mean we don't have problems. But that is to be our defining manner of life as people look at us. That is our daily offering that we give to God. And so we want to talk this morning about growing together. Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 11, as our brother Joel has so capably read. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up or the edifying of the body of Christ. God has given us the apostles, the prophets, evangelists, 
the pastors, which are our elders and teachers, for a twofold purpose that we're going to look at. And it's not so they can do the work of ministry, it's to prepare all of us for the work of ministry. We all have a role to play. And we are going to be growing together through this process. Would you pray with me as we begin? Our Father and our God in heaven, we love you so much. We thank you for the blessings of this day. And we're so grateful, Father, for your precious word, for the guidance and the correction and the encouragement that we receive from it. As we study from it this morning, Father, we ask for your richest blessings to be upon us. In the name of your Son, Jesus, our Savior. Amen. He continues that we are to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until when? Till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. So as we look, the entire point is growth. Equipping the saints is to cause growth for the body of Christ. Now, as we mentioned a few moments ago, the, the twofold purpose. His calling for us is to be involved in the works of ministry. Now, ministry there does not mean have an official title. It doesn't mean to have, uh, you know, a business card that says, if you all have Church of Christ evangelist on it, that's not what it's talking about. Ministry is the service that we offer to God by offering to others. That's our service. That's what ministry is. It's being servants of God to equip the saints to his calling, which is the works of ministry. And we have a lot of different ministries here at the Puyallup Church. And some we do better at than others, but we're still growing together. We're still working. We're trying to mature and trying to do better day by day so that we can be more effective. And we're going to look at some things today that are going to help us as we grow. Number one, his calling. Number two, his purpose, the building up of the body of Christ. As you look at the letter to the church in Ephesus, in chapter 1, 22 and 23, and he has given all things to Christ, put all things under his feet, put him in charge of all things to the church, which is his body. That's in the opening section of the letter. So whenever you see the body, what do we have to think of? The church. When we see the word church, what do we think of? The body. Those two phrases are used in this letter interchangeably. So when we see for uh, equipping the saints for the work of ministry, number one, and then number two, for the building up or the edifying of the body of Christ, what are we talking about? We're talking about building up the church body, the body of Christ, made up of many members. Now, it's not that easy to build up the body of Christ in India when you're in Washington State. You might be able to encourage some things along the way, but our primary focus has to be where whatever congregation you are a part of, that is where you're trying to build. You know, there's an old saying, and you've probably heard it many times, that you need to grow where you're planted, right? And so we don't, we don't want to try to grow someplace we're not planted, we want to grow where we are planted, and right here in Puyallup is where the majority of us who are present today are planted. And so we want to grow here, and we want to try to build up the body together. 
So we see his calling is for us to be involved in the works of ministry, and his purpose for us to be in that ministry is to build up the body of Christ. We are to grow together. And this is about spiritual maturity. As you look at verses 13 through 16, everything that is expressed there has to do with the maturation process. To grow, to mature. My wife's brother was born two years before she was. He's the only boy of four children. He's the third in line. And when he was, he looked normal, he acted normal, everything seemed normal about him. But by the time he was two or three years old, he still hadn't started talking. And they ran tests on him. It turns out that he was mentally retarded. But to look at him, there was nothing about him that showed any kind of genetic situation or anything about him that would you would look at him and say there's anything wrong, different, uh, restricted, or what have you about him. He's 62 years old now. He and my son David share a birthday. He's 62 years old. If you saw him today, you would not think there was anything different about him until he opens his mouth and you realize you're talking to a child. You would not see anything different. That's not normal. Now, Brooks is a wonderful human being. He's a child in a man's body. He's a wonderful human being. But it's not normal for a 62-year-old to have the mind of a 7- or 8-year-old. That's not normal. That's not normal. You see, when we see each other, when we see children, what is our expectation for them? That we would grow up that we would mature, that we would grow physically and grow emotionally and grow mentally. That is our expectation. And when that doesn't work out in our families with our children, we get concerned, don't we? And we try to find solutions. And then, we, then when those solutions are not available, then we find coping mechanisms in order to help them through whatever circumstance of life they have. In the church, we should be more concerned when we see brothers and sisters not maturing than we are. We should be concerned that they're not growing up. We should be concerned that 62-year-olds have the spiritual maturity of a 7-year-old. That should concern us. Because the entire goal... The purpose for which we have apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers is for the church to be built up. It's to be built up. Can you imagine if our high schools were filled with six-year-olds? And we're trying to teach them advanced calculus? What's our education system going to look like? It's going to be a disaster. Now, I know there are probably some six-year-olds that can do calculus, but that is the exception rather than the rule. The rule is six-year-olds are still trying to figure out some very basic things. But yet, we're in high school and church, and we've got a bunch of kindergartners. The church is not mature. We need to be about maturing each other. This spiritual maturity is critical What is his desire for us when it comes to spiritual maturity? Unity of the faith. It is difficult for us to be unified in the faith when people are not growing in the faith. We have to grow in the faith together. We have to mature together. This is so important. We're always going to have people who are further along than others. We're always going to have people that are behind. And the reason is because we have babes in Christ, new converts to Christ, who are going to be behind those who are a little further into it, behind them, spiritually speaking, because they're growing. This is new. In the same way, 
that we have children and we have teenagers and we have young adults and we have middle adults and then we have those who become teenagers again in their 70s and 80s and 90s, right? And we're just, just, we see that physically. We don't think there's anything odd about that. There shouldn't be anything odd about different levels of maturity within the body, but the body as a whole has got to keep moving forward. What if a high school never graduated anyone? Would that be concerning? Should be, especially when you see how much of our tax dollars go to schools. That would be concerning that we're not graduating people from our schools. Something's not right, either with our students, with our system, with our teachers, or all of the above. There's, there's a problem, and, and we have to fix it. Same in the church. We need to be growing. His desire for us is unity of the faith. He desires for us to have heart knowledge of the Son of God. Now, notice in verse 13, till we come to unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. This word knowledge here is a special word for knowledge. It doesn't mean knowing the facts. It means being able to use that in a productive way. Heart knowledge. Because everything we do as Christians has got to emanate from our hearts. It's, it's got to be because of our love for him. Not because we've got an intellectual prowess. Not because we've memorized a bunch of facts. But because we know deep down inside of us, this is what is right. This is what he has taught us to do. This is who he has taught us to be. To a perfect man, the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ. A strong, mature full-grown body is the ultimate goal. That is his desire for us. Is that not your desire for your children? That you want them to be strong, mature, and full-grown? To be able to take care of themselves? And absolutely it is. But where does it start? It starts with us having to feed them and change their diapers and do all those kinds of things. But if we're still having to do that many years later, there's obviously something that is amiss. The desire that Jesus has for us is for us to be a full-grown body to the fullness of Christ. There's our goal, to be like Christ. Every individual desiring to be like Christ, the collection of individuals known as the body of Christ, the church of Christ, those of us collectively maturing together to be like Christ. Walking in love demands that from us. A vibrant spiritual strength. Vibrant strength. No defects. There are two great enemies to growth in the church, to build up the body. The first is departure from the truth or a compromise with the lie that Satan gives us, either in word or in deed. That, that is a great enemy, number one, to the growth of the body. Departure from the truth. Now, you know, we have all these great ideas You know, Jesus did a miraculous feeding, and he drew a huge crowd. John chapter 6. You know what he did the next day? He ran most of them off because their heart was not right. You know, there's a lot of things we could do to draw a crowd in the church. Jesus didn't call for us to draw a crowd. He called for us to make disciples. If you make disciples and you do it the right way, the numbers are going to increase, but they're going to increase in the correct way. You want to draw a crowd? Well, let's get Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus in here. We can draw a crowd. We can fill this place up. Is that what God desires for his body? He desires for us to grow, to mature. And so when we depart from the things that we know are right, and we listen to the lies that come from Satan, we're not going to experience the type of growth that God desires for us. Secondly, indifference to the plight of others 
You know, when we look around us, what do we see? We see a lost and dying world that is in desperate need of the saving blood of Jesus Christ. Now, departure from the truth is a great enemy to growth, but number two is indifference, because if you're indifferent to the plight of the people who are lost in the world, you're not going to reach out to them. You're not going to try to to help them to see Jesus. You're not going to try to draw them to the truth that Jesus died for them, that he paid the price for their sins on the cross, that he desires eternal life for them. Indifference. But you know, incredible growth is attainable. You look at verse 15. Speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. I I am a person who believes when God says something that he means what he says. And I don't believe that God gave us impossibilities to frustrate us. I believe he gave us probabilities that we could reach these levels, but it would require effort to get there. And it may seem impossible to us, but you know what seems impossible when you're a kindergartner? Passing a calculus test in high school. When you get to high school, well, now you have built up your math acumen to the point that you're able to handle calculus. You're able to handle chemistry. When I first started studying the Koine Greek, which the New Testament is written in, and I was seeing people take proficiency exams for the Greek language, that was an impossibility. I'm just sitting there looking at a couple of words going, blepo? Blepo? Really? And, and I'm trying to figure it out. Well, Six years later, I passed a Greek proficiency in my comprehensive exam for my master's degree. You know, sometimes when we see the end, we don't see the steps to get there, and it seems like an impossibility. It's not an impossibility. Incredible growth is attainable. We're not helpless children on a sea of uncertainty. We're not being tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine like children. We chase after things, spiritually speaking. We chase after things that do not benefit us, but they occupy our time, and sometimes they make us feel good, but they don't ultimately get us to where we need to be. We must no longer be children tossed to and fro. We can't allow those things to be a part of who we are. And so we speak the truth in love. Now let me tell you something. And I'm going to define this for you, and I hope that you can understand what I'm saying. But speaking the truth in love doesn't mean you never hurt somebody's feelings. Well, I got one amen out of that. The world doesn't want to have their feelings hurt. The world doesn't want to be challenged. Many members in the church don't want to have their feelings hurt or be challenged. But let me tell you something. When we look just like the world, we're not doing what we ought to do. I had this come across my news feed last night. I've blanked out this individual's name for a reason. Well, I decided not to ride all night. He's talking about his motorcycle. Have church in the morning. So I was going to make muffaletta pasta and had none of the ingredients, then I was going to grill some chicken, had no chicken, and indeed did not want to go out. So a baby DiGiorno, a tasty beverage, picture of it right there, and a big and Big Bang Theory. You see this right here? Now, I'm not judging what people do in the privacy of their own home, but folks, you know who put this on Facebook last night? A gospel preacher. You know what he looks like? He looks like the rest of the world. 
he looks like everybody else. And, and knowing him like I do, that's what he's trying to do. He's trying to be like everybody else. He's running a popularity contest. Now, what would you think if I posted this on my Facebook page and you came into church this morning? What would your impression of me be? Now, I want you to think, am I different than any other member of the church? Shouldn't be. Folks, speaking the truth in love doesn't mean we're always coddling each other. Sometimes we have to speak the truth in love with a loving motivation in order to, for people to grow from being children tossed to and fro to become mature in the faith. Secondly, a heart knowledge of the Son of God. We've got to grow in our knowledge, but it can't just be a matter of facts that we recite. It's not just, I know the books of the Bible, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, Acts, and letters to the Romans. What good does it do you? You've got to have heart knowledge of those things. You've got to know what, what you do with this. There are things that you may know, but does it benefit you? Does it define who you are? Is it just something that you know? A strong, mature, full-grown body. That's what is required of us. That, and if we're going to walk in love, that's what we've been told to do. That's who we've told to be. Now, as you look throughout chapters 4 and 5, he tells us how to do this. Starting in verse 25 of chapter 4, he tells us, not to lie to each other. Don't be angry. Let the sun go down on our anger. He tells us not to use corrupt speech. He tells us to be forgiving, tender-hearted, and kind to one another. To imitate God. He tells us not to be partakers of the works of darkness. He tells us to put worship in its proper setting don't be drunk with wine in which is dissipation but be filled with the spirit speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing and making melody in our heart to the lord we're to submit to one another out of the fear of god our marriages are to reflect the relationship that christ has with his church chapter 5 beginning in verse 22 and 23 Husbands, love your wives as Christ also loved the church. Wives, submit to your husbands. That doesn't mean be subservient, because just before that in verse 22, it says that we are submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord. We're not subservient to each other, but God has put an order to things. We need to respect his order. Husbands, love your wives until they do something you don't like. Now, you're to love your wife as Christ loved the church and did what? Gave himself for her. How did he give himself for the church? He died for the church. Children are to respect their parents. Parents are to raise their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. The beginning of chapter 6. I mean, you see, all of these things are the things that we need in order to move toward maturity. You've heard me say it before, I'm going to say it again. The church in Ephesus did not receive these instructions because they had it all figured out. They, had, they received these instructions because they were guilty of not doing the things they were told. Why do we have them today? Because we're still going to need these instructions because we're still going to fall down in these areas. We need to grow. And that growth is attainable. We as the body are to be joined and knit together. When one part of the body hurts, we all hurt. We got two brothers here today that are hurting because they've lost very close family members over the last week or two. 
we got another brother here that's hurting because his beloved wife of over 50 years is in Tacoma General. We have other people that are hurting here today for various reasons. We're joined and knit together. We share in the hurts. We share in the joys. Perfectly joined together. Verse 16, every part does its share. Folks, there are, uh, if, if you know this, this golf term, stick with me. There are no mulligans in the Christian life. You don't know what a mulligan is? That's when you hit a ball and you don't like it and you hit another one over and you don't count the first one. Probably some Irishman named Mulligan came up with that hundreds of years ago and it stuck. But there's no mulligans. Everybody's got to do their share. Everybody. And not everybody shares the same. What is the role of your big toe on your foot? You don't think about it, do you? Okay, some of you might think it's an implement to find furniture in the dark, but that's not true. There was a brother in Christ who hit the beaches, Omaha Beach, scaled the cliffs at Point Hawk on D-Day, June 6, 1944. I knew him intimately. He was a beautiful soul. Six weeks after that, he was blown up by a mortar and shot with a German burp gun at the same time. It took him two years to recover from his wounds. One of his wounds was he had his big toe blown off of his foot. You know how he stood? He stood like this. You know why? Because one of the reasons you have a big toe is to help you balance when you stand. Can you live without your big toe? Yep. Not as well as you can with it, though. Church is the same way. Some people are big toes. They help us keep our balance. Do your job. I never realized how much I needed my pinky until I had it in a splint for 16 weeks after my motorcycle crash in Guyana. This thing's still trying to heal. It's still swollen. It's still giving me a hard way to go. But I never realized that when you reach in your pocket that your pinky is what scoops things into your hand. You probably don't realize it either. Put a splint on your pinky and try to get something out of your pocket and you'll figure it out. Can you live without your pinky? You sure can. Can you live well without it? Probably not as well. There's a reason God gave us five on each. Right? Every part of your body is useful. It's necessary, and every part of the body of Christ is useful and necessary. Fulfill your role in the church. Figure it out. Fulfill your role. Every part does its share. And in doing this, it causes the growth of the body, building itself up in love. Why do we cause the body to grow? Because we love the body of Christ. And we love the individual members of the body of Christ. And we want to glorify God. If we destroy the body of Christ, either through negligence, indifference, or through departure, is that going to glorify God? That's not going to glorify Him. You know what glorifies Him? Maturing the way He's called for us to mature, to build up the body, and for us to grow together in a very effective way and walk in love just as Christ loved us and gave himself a sacrifice for us a sweet smelling aroma Paul writes in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1 I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God this is your reasonable service a living sacrifice every day that you're alive you are to live as a sacrifice to God that's the challenge you know we talk about impossibilities how would you like to be a 25 year old alcoholic who goes through detox 
and sits there and thinks, I've got to stay sober for the next 50 or 60 years. Do you think that's what they're told when they go to their group meetings? You know what they're told? One day at a time. You want to walk in love? You want to mature? It's one day at a time. You don't have to worry about what you're going to do two days from now. It's today. And walk in love. That is the the challenge, the charge that we are given there in chapters 4 and 5 in Ephesians. God loved us. He sent Jesus to die for us. Not so we could just have a gathering on, on one day of the week, but so that we could live a full and abundant life. John 10, 10. He came that we might have life and have it abundantly. That abundant life is lived to the glory of God, encouraging each other, building one another up, bringing others to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That is his, his charge to us. We remembered his death a few moments ago. Jesus died so that you might live. He died for you. And if you're here today and you've not accepted that incredible sacrifice that was made for you, do you believe, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Are you willing to turn from the sins in your life, the sins that separated you from God, the sins that, that caused Jesus to have to go to that cross? Are you in a position to where you understand and are willing to say, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? And in doing so, giving up your life and being buried in water for the remission of your sins, that is baptized, where God applies the blood of Christ to your soul, washes you clean, you're raised to walk in a new life, a forgiven life, clothed in Jesus Christ. Can we help you with that today? We're about to sing a song. If you have that need, we want you to make it known to us. If you are here today as a child of God, having done those things, and you're struggling, maybe you're struggling with, with grief, you're struggling with discouragement, you're struggling with depression, you're struggling with finances and your relationships, whatever your struggle is, it's real. And we want to help. We want to pray with you, pray for you, and encourage you today. But we can't help if we don't know. So won't you make it known to us as together we stand and as we sing this morning.